Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Previously, when several primary and middle schools in China started to resume classes, we touch on the impact of COVID-19 on education. This time, we want to dig deeper into the impact of global higher education. Earlier, I talked to Phil Batty, who is the Chief Knowledge Officer of Times Higher Education. Mr. Batty, who has been working in the field for 20 years, in fact, in the global higher education sector, including more than seven years as editor of the World University Rankings. This year, despite difficulties due to the pandemic, Times Higher Education still managed to release the ranking of Asia's top 100 universities. Chinese institutions occupy the top spots, with Tsinghua University in the first place and Peking University in second. So what do the rankings mean and how can Asian universities improve their competitiveness in the global arena? Let's listen to Mr. Batty's answers. You put out the ranking of the top 100 Asian universities and in fact the two Chinese universities got the two top spots. Tell me more about that. Yes, I've been saying for several years now that um, China is one of the great success stories of global higher education and this new ranking has really proven that this is the first time in the history of this ranking that we have um, both number one and number two are Chinese universities. We have Tsinghua in number one and uh, Beida Peking in the second place. It's the first time it's happened. We also have other top ten Chinese universities and many others rising up this list. So it's a great, great uh, demonstration of the investment, the commitment that China has made over recent years, actually recent decades, mm -hmm. to improve and strengthen its uh, global competitiveness in higher education and knowledge transfer. What are some of the most important barometers and principles you are looking at when you judge whether one university is quote-unquote better than the others? is based on 13 different metrics, um, a really good cross-section of all the things that make uh, a great university, teaching, research, knowledge transfer, international outlook. But we push hard on research. What's driving China's success, I believe, is increasingly powerful, relevant, impactful research. You know, your scholars are doing great, great research. It's changing the uh, body of knowledge, uh, pushing the boundaries of knowledge forward, and that's being recognized through these rankings, through the, um, the increased publication and citation rates. We're looking at um, t tens of millions of citations to 12 million research papers published globally, and that's what's driving it. But there's a whole range of factors involved. What specific areas do you think these days the world especially appreciate? East Asian universities have been excelling in the traditional, the so-called hard sciences, um, the STEM fields, science, technology, mm -hmm. um, and engineering. And I think the reason for that is that universities in East Asia have perhaps been more important in the economic journey, the rise of economic power in, in South Korea, for example, in China as well, of course, the rise from sort of manufacturing into knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, it's those fields that have really been excelling. And you can see it even in some of the geopolitical areas around technology. Um, you know, it's quite clear the global discussion around um, 5G, for example, it's quite clear that uh, Chinese companies uh, dominate the 5G space. They have the uh, superior technology in this area, which is causing all sorts of ramifications uh, in terms of geopolitics and global trade. So it's those areas, um, STEM areas, that uh, China and East Asian nations have excelled at. But I would argue we should really support the, the whole body of knowledge. You know, philosophy will be important. Mm. Humanities, arts and humanities will be vital. Mm -hmm. And social science essential to drive forward our world in an uncertain future with the uh, fourth industrial revolution, the post-coronavirus um, landscape, and uh, climate change. Right. There is a lot of talk about the new normal, Phil, if you know what I mean. That how will economies and all circumstances change as a result of a public health crisis. And it really depends not on us, but rather on how this virus works and how we're going to face up to viruses like this for the future. Uh, how much impact do you think it will have on the nature of universities and also the way universities teach uh, and interact among themselves and also within itself? 
actually I had a conversation with uh, Chiu Yong, the president of Tsinghua University, mm -hmm. uh, just last week, and they have tradi uh, transitioned to delivering their courses online through the internet exceptionally well. And funnily enough, he said the interactions uh, with students have improved. Student engagement levels are higher because the technologies and tools have allowed them to interact and learn more effectively than the traditional classroom environment. Mm. So some universities are making that change wonderfully, others less so, and others are perhaps just reproducing traditional lectures on Zoom or on other formats. And that's, that's a worry because I think that's a a less a high quality and inferior experience. So there's a really powerful move, I think, to a permanent shift to what you might call blended learning, mm -hmm. where we still have small groups and hopefully face-to-face -face contact that's vital in terms of the students' ability to interact and learn from one another. But we put more material online and we use technology to really support learning. So I think probably university teaching has changed for good, uh, changed forever, um, and, and changed very significantly you know, the quarantine and the close down and the, the lockdown uh, actually make a whole year of students that we have never seen in the past decades that have to skip classes. Of course, they have online classes, but they would never be able to face one another. They would not be able to see their professors uh, face to face either. They are not going to be in, in the same university physically at the same time. So this is the very first time a very different year, a very different uh, uh, grade of students. How do you see this is likely to change their life and, and maybe how they see universities? I do believe actually that the technological opportunities that we have today, the, 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 um, the innovation that we're seeing in universities can protect the learning experience, the exchange of knowledge, the ability of students to interact, um, the really important aspects of education, which are not just passively listening to a lecture, it's actively learning in a, in a small group, in a discourse, in an exchange. We can protect those to some extent. So I hope profoundly that we don't see uh, multiple cohorts of people with less education. Mm. Um, we may see them with less life experience, but <laughs> certainly I think we can protect their education. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, you know, the world is just rapidly moving into a fourth industrial revolution space where technology will be a much more profound part of people's lives. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence will become more and more powerful in people's worlds. So in some respects, I, I think it's um, it's accelerating perhaps a natural move to an ever more digital world that, that, that young people will grow into. In past decades, globalization has helped change the idea of international education. Students from all corners of the world have had a chance to study outside their home country. But the rise of deglobalization pursued by some led to fewer collaborations with less universities doing scarcer work, often on a less equal footing. So how can educators and the educational systems at large cope with the new realities? Let's listen in. Geopolitics make your ranking also see in a different lens by some. Uh, Phil, tell me more about that too. Actually, there's a really interesting moment uh, in geopolitics here around the balance of power in the knowledge economy between mm. the East and the West. You know, traditionally those Western universities, the American great schools like Harvard, Stanford, and, and, and the UK schools, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, they've dominated and they still do dominate. But I think we've been seeing over time a shift towards a great strengthening of East Asian uh, universities led by China. And I wonder whether this is a moment where this could accelerate further. Um, you know, the geopolitical issues mean, I think, Britain, the UK can be more isolated through Brexit, for example, less able to access talent. The U.S. has some really um, strong immigration uh, issues that mean they're being uh, cut off from talent. And the coronavirus crisis, COVID-19, I think, could accelerate change. The Western universities have relied on the flow of international talent. People, great, talented academic students flowing through to those great universities in America and Britain. That flow will stop in the short term, but I think there could be long-term changes. So the circulation of talent could really be focused in on East Asia. East Asian students might stay in East Asia. The rising rankings mean the universities are more attractive 
which helps the universities rise even further up the rankings. We see more division in our world. We see more rhetorical media hypes in our world. All of this will have tremendous impact on students and also on our educational system. At least in some educational systems, there used to be the belief that you know, the market economy and uh, you know, certain kinds of political arrangement for the society is uh, the option. Uh, meanwhile, there's also uh, the um, uh, collective belief in globalization, but now we also see some problems with this potential for now. And at the same time, there used to be a belief in peace and stability and coexistence and bearing with one another to have a multilateral cooperation, coordination, but now that's been changing. So some of the basic concepts that have been ingrained in the higher education in our world now is being challenged by realities. Bill, how do you talk to educators about this? I think the one thing that gives me great faith in the future um, is that universities always do ultimately transcend short-term politics. So, of course, I think the coronavirus, various factors have seen the rise of nationalism and protectionism in, in, in countries. Universities do tend to hold this spirit of, um, as you say, international collaboration, um, free exchange of ideas, mm -hmm. sharing knowledge in a way that transcends um, particular politicians being in office for a particular period of time. So I hope these institutions, often hundreds of years old, protect those principles that we are one humanity, that we share the same goals, we have the same problems, we are all facing climate change, we're all facing uh, some serious challenges um, facing this planet. We need mm -hmm. to tackle them together, uh, we need to cooperate, and universities do uphold that spirit. And, and I hope even through short-term barriers or short-term protectionist uh, activities, scholars themselves, the individual scholars, will seek out like-minded people and like-minded collaborators to share their knowledge and share ideas. Mm -hmm. And I hope coronavirus accelerates this understanding that universities have this wonderful role. Their role is to make the world a better place mm -hmm. in, in global harmony. And I think the coronavirus response, even though it's whipped up tensions, it's whipped up nationalist sentiments, Ultimately, we will see we only solve these problems by sharing, by collaborating, by working together across borders. And we should see that with the virologists and the epidemiologists who are studying the um, pandemic and trying to solve the pandemic. And also the social scientists, the economists who are going to have to work incredibly hard for the whole world to emerge from an economic crisis. Yes. So my faith is, is in universities is, is very, very strong and their ability to weather the storm and keep those principles true is, is, is always very high. There were times when the world was in trouble, uh, but we managed to climb out of it and also create something even more innovative than it used to be. Uh, but what kinds of qualities university have to have in order to be able to enable their students who are the leaders of tomorrow to, to do that? I think universities need to re re remember their role in social cohesion um, and social um, inclusion mm -hmm. and there are some institutions I think globally that need to have a think about how do we open up to great talent not open up to the more privileged people who are obviously talented and smart but finding that great talent and, and, and the great potential in people from a more excluded groups. Right. So I think that's a really big thing that should come out of this. And maybe the technological changes can support that, can, can open up university to a wider range of people and a wider, um, wider groups in society and, and hopefully um, really support the whole world in um, tackling these big inequalities that have been highlighted very much by recent events.